you guys for being here, and I'd just like to get a sense of who's in the audience. So how many of you are here just for general information about heart healthy foods? Okay. And how many of you are here because of a health concern that either you have or a loved one has? Okay. And, um, and how many of you are patients at the Vassar Center for Natural Health? Is anyone here a patient? Oh, well, thank you for being a patient here. You provide very important learning opportunities for our students, and so we really appreciate it. We know that you have a lot of options in where you get your health care, and um, it's nice to have patients like you here to help our students learn. So it's very important to them, so thank you very much. Um, we're going to go ahead and get uh, started with our talk here tonight, which is on heart healthy foods. However, before we start talking about the heart, we're going to uh, take a step back, and first we're going to talk about our arteries, because although we talk about heart disease, and we... Um, Often what we're really referring to is disease in the arteries that supply blood and oxygen and other nutrients to the heart. And then through changes in the artery wall, it ultimately restricts blood flow and then that is what causes damage to the heart muscle itself. And so really, a lot of the damage ha happens within the arteries, not in the heart per se, although over time the heart does get damaged. So um, the arteries are, are made up of several layers and um, here the inner layer, the innermost layer, is a layer that we call the endothelial layer. And you'll hear me talk a lot about the endothelium, so remember this. And the endothelium is special because, because it is the inner lining of the artery. It is really the first layer to be exposed to whatever it is that you put in your body. And so sometimes these are things that we breathe through the air and diesel exhaust and other chemicals, and therefore the inner lining of our arteries within our lungs, the endothelium gets exposed to this. Similarly, when we eat and we absorb different things from our food, the inner lining of our arteries throughout our digestive tract and ultimately into our heart get exposed to what we've just eaten. And so they act as a really important, the endothelium acts as a really important filter. The inner layer here is a layer that we call the intima media. And you can see here that as we go from a normal artery to mild atherosclerosis or disease in the artery to more severe atherosclerosis, we can see this intima media layer start to thicken and we see this yellowish plaque start to form. Okay? So that's where our body stores junk, basically, trash that has happened in our body, and, and it, like, it tucks it away, and it buries it in this inner layer of our Okay, so now that we've seen the inside of our arteries and the cross-section of our arteries, now I want to talk to you about the uh, inflammatory response that can happen after certain meal choices. And this figure is an adaptation from research that was done by an Italian cardiologist named Antonio Seriello. And what Dr. Seriello did is he fed a group of people, some of them had diabetes, some of them were healthy, and he fed them one of three different meals. And he measured changes in various inflammatory parameters after feeding them those foods. And so one of the meals, that quote meals, that he fed them was 75 grams of sugar in, mixed in a, in a drink called an oral glucose tolerance test. And um, one of the other meals that he fed them was 80 grams of fat as whipped cream flavored with sugar, or just flavored with vanilla. And so basically, a big slug of sugar or a big slug of fat. Or the third meal was that he actually mixed the sugar into the fat and fed that to these individuals, okay? So you get the idea. Slug of sugar, slug of fat, slug of sugar and fat, okay? So this is what we see here when we, uh, these are the changes that happen in blood sugar and this is the change that happened in blood fat for several hours after the meal. So here's zero through four hours after the meal. We can see, of course, blood sugar went up and then over time, fat went up. But the other things that he measured were, again, changes in these inflammatory parameters. And so one of these inflammatory parameters is called C-reactive protein. Some of you have maybe have heard of that or have had it measured yourself. And so C-reactive protein, we can see that after the sugar and the fat, C-reactive protein increased in the short term after this meal, within four hours. And um, another one of these markers is a marker of oxidative stress. And it's actually, it's called nitrotyrosine, but that's not really important. What's important is that that measure, too, increased over time after this meal, just from sugar and fat, isolated. Now, perhaps the most important finding was this finding here represented by the green dots, and you can see it's labeled FMD. Well, FMD stands for flow-mediated dilation. And so dilation is when something opens, and in this case, it's referring to the arteries, so it's the arteries open. And you can see that after the sugar and the fat, it actually dilated less, right? Flow-mediated dilation actually went down, meaning that and that corresponds to these increase in various inflammatory markers. So that means that after consuming, in just a general, ordinary, healthy person, after consuming this slug of sugar or this slug of fat, we see this change in inflammatory markers, and we actually see the arteries less able to deliver oxygen and nutrients to the places that the oxygen and nutrients need to go. We see them, they don't dilate as much, okay? 
And so these are exposures that we're all, we are all exposed to these things, right? Sugar and fat are everywhere. We're in our diet all over the place. And so over time, the theory is, is that this inflammatory change begins to accumulate, leading to that plaque that we saw in the uh, uh, layer of the heart. And so really, atherosclerosis can be thought of a process of oxidation and storage, where there's some exposure. Here we see a nice, fresh car in this case, but it could be the inner line of an artery. There's some exposure leading to an oxidative change. And oxidation, you know, a common example of oxidation is rust. And then our immune system actually swallows that because it's been damaged and it buries it inside, or at first it accumulates, and then ultimately it buries it inside that middle layer of our artery. So if we look at it again in the artery, then here we have some exposure. FR stands for free radical or some, some oxidative stress exposure. So we have some free radical that and then instead of a car, in the case of our bodies, it's actually our LDL cholesterol, or our low-density lipoproteins. And so we have, the, we have this exposure, free radical changes our LDL, basically causing oxidation of the LDL, or OxLDL. It triggers our immune system, causing our immune system to come along and engulf the now damaged LDL. The LDL accumulates within our immune cells, forming a cell called a foam cell, and then gradually our, our body buries it again in the inner layer of our arteries. So we have again exposure, oxidation, engulfment, accumulation, and storage. And that is essentially the process of atherosclerosis as we understand it today. So you might be or you might think, well, okay, so that's interesting, but what actually, when we look at you know large groups of people, what, what risk factors do we actually see from, from having um, a, a significant vascular event. You know, most people have heard of a heart attack and we're concerned about having a heart attack or having a stroke. And so what are the risk factors when we look at the diet? What are the risk factors that actually um, seem to increase our risk for having a heart attack versus those that may reduce our risk? And so on this slide, the, the risk factors are the factors that actually increase our chances of having a heart attack are in red. And then we have some, um, some sort of intermediate factors here in, in orange, and then we have protective factors here in green. And so the protective factors are daily fruit and vegetable consumption. Not really that surprising. Most people know that they should eat more fruits and vegetables. Moderate alcohol consumption. So this is sometimes a, a, a surprise that actually moderate intakes of alcohol are, are considered to be protective against heart disease and vascular disease. It's just that it's really kind of difficult for most people to just stay with moderate intake of alcohol. And they tend to go a little too far in the other direction. And that's when it actually can increase risk for things like having high blood pressure. Um, and then another protective factor that many of us are aware of is regular physical activity. And we know that getting um, frequent physical activity, at least 150 minutes per week, is very important for maintaining our body weight, to not gain weight as we age. However, of course, if we want to lose weight, then we actually have to kind of up it a little bit, and we need to get more than 150 minutes per week. So these are some protective factors. However, some of these risk factors, such as elevated cholesterol, high blood pressure, risk for diabetes and obesity, those things also have contribution from diet, right? So if we, make the, if we make healthy dietary choices, then we can actually lower our cholesterol. Of course, it's not gonna impact our smoking, that's a different, it's non-diet related, but it can impact our, high, our, our blood pressure, leading um, to either higher blood pressure or lower blood pressure. Certainly, we know that obesity is caused by diet, so gaining weight is certainly caused by, or at least is uh, the main contributor is just eating too many calories to begin with. And our risk for diabetes is certainly affected by our dietary choices as well. So instead of changing our diet, we often see a recommendation um, by cardiologists to do things like take medications, right? And so this article is asking the question, can a statin neutralize the cardiovascular risk of unhealthy dietary choices, right? Because let's face it, we don't actually want to change the way we eat. We don't want to improve the quality of the food. We really just want to take a medication that will reduce our risk. And this article actually found the investigators in this research study, although they didn't actually um, study it per se, it took a large data set and sort of analyzed this question, they actually found that if you take a statin um, every day, that it actually does offset your risk of having both a cheeseburger and a milkshake on a daily basis. So from a statistical point of view, you actually can take a medication and reduce your risk somewhat. Um, however, you also see that in this particular figure which accompanied that article, and even though it's promoting this max statin and it's saying, oh, I'm neutralizing it, it says better ways to reduce your risk from death from a heart attack include healthy eating, exercise, maintaining healthy weight, and not smoking. See your doctor for complete advice. So there's some language here that says, yeah, okay, they understand that it's, there's more to it than just taking the medication. However, the take-home message of this is, well, if you take a statin, then 
maybe you don't have to worry about this. So, not surprisingly, if we look at what the, the costs have changed in healthcare, we see that the most significant uh, item that has impacted the cost of healthcare is, of course, an over-dependence upon prescription drugs instead of actually making the dietary changes that help reduce our risk. So that's unfortunate. And um, I'll give you a second to Right, so unfortunately many patients in the, in the United States find themselves in this situation where their doctor says, well I can operate or you can go on a strict diet, and the patient says, well you better operate, and the doctor says, are you sure? And the patient says, well my insurance doesn't cover a strict diet, right? So it's easier to get an intervention in our country and to have a stent placed or to have a bypass surgery or to do something else than it is to actually have the dietary advice that, that the public needs covered by our insurance. And that's unfortunate, it's changing somewhat, and fortunately, here in, in Washington State, many insurance providers cover the services of naturopathic physicians, and more and more insurance providers are covering the services of dietitians. And so in Washington, we actually have very generous um, access to good dietary advice. And so clearly, you guys are interested in that, or you wouldn't be. So that, you know, it's easy to, to say, well, okay, well, we need to change our diet to be more heart healthy. But diet is, it can be a really confusing topic. And there are a lot of different opinions out there about the right way to eat or the wrong way to eat. Clearly, tonight you're gonna to hear mine because you've signed up for that. But it is very confusing and there are many, many lenses to view diet through. And so there's you know, the broad classification of fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, meats, you know, that type of classification. There's classification based on macronutrient content. So this is carbohydrates or protein or fats. Foods get classified based on their micronutrients, things like vitamins and minerals and various enzymes. Um, there are other nutrients, there are trace minerals, flavonoids, polyphenols, anthocyanidins. See these long, long words, the words just keep getting longer and longer. And you wonder why people can't make good dietary choices. And it's because diet gets too complex like this. There's all this stuff. And at the end of the day, you guys need to know, well, what should I eat? Like, what choices should I make? What should I buy from the grocery store? So we uh, here at Bastier have really sought to simplify uh, diet and making healthier diet choices. And we've created a, a manual, we use this in our uh, clinic, in our diabetes and heart disease clinic, and it's simply called the Food User Manual. And um, I'm gonna show you some example content from the uh, Food User Manual, and we'll give you some healthy diet tips. So you've heard me say it a few times already, you're gonna hear it just one more time at least, that the number one rule of thumb, based on findings and, and lots and lots of different studies, is to eat five to seven servings of fruits and vegetables per day. Lots of colorful fruits and vegetables, no matter what the form. Ideally, some of them should be raw, but cooked vegetables are more protective than, than no vegetables at all. And interestingly, even things like potatoes and ketchup. Ketchup is considered a vegetable in a lot of nutritional epidemiology. So if you eat a lot of ketchup, it has lycopene in it. It comes from tomatoes. It's a little bit processed, but it's generally a pretty simple food. And it's considered a vegetable. So even things like potatoes and ketchup count. But more ideally would be to diversify your fruit and vegetable intake and make sure that you get many, many colors, different colors throughout the day. And you know, like the manual says, just forget the big words, right? It doesn't matter if it's a polyphenol or a flavonoid or whatever. You can tell the colors. We've known our colors since kindergarten. We know whether or not we're getting that in our diet. These are some interesting uh, results from a study that I performed here at Bastyr in collaboration with the University of Washington. And um, in our study, what we did is we measured that modified cholesterol, that oxidized cholesterol, and we measured that after we gave people one of four different treatments. And one treatment, of course, was a placebo, and that's this flat blue line. Another treatment was we um, actually provided them with small uh, soups or salads that were designed to be high in the colorful pigments in fruits and vegetables called carotene. And we actually designed these foods to be high in some particular fractions, and we, we provided this food for people to come, and they, we, they were asked to eat um, one serving, one meal that we provided them every day. And then we measured the change in their oxidized uh, cholesterol. So here we see the diet fruit. You can see that here, and this is the fasting, right? So this is after the meal, similar to the other study. This is in the fasting state. So when the diet group came in, their oxidized LDL in the fasting state was substantially lower than it was in the placebo group. And then the other two, uh, treatment arms were actually two different supplements that were also high in these carotene fractions. And so what our results suggest is that there's something about increasing our intake of these pigments that does impact and does actually lower the tendency for our LDL cholesterol to become oxidized. 
And so over time, it makes sense that by lowering that oxidation state, we get less of that modification, and therefore we get less of that accumulation in our arteries as well. So we're actually starting to see, um, including some of the research here at Bastyr University, some mechanistic reasons why these keratin fractions are probably protective against heart disease. Our second um, heart healthy eating uh, rule of thumb is to use, quote, good oils. And these, um, these are uh, unrefined oils, and they're often better consumed, that is, they're less inflammatory when they're consumed in their raw or uncooked state. And so some good oils include olive oil. Um, avocado oil is very delicious, but it is rather expensive. Um, flaxseed oil, again, uncooked. Um, Grapeseed oil can be cooked. It's actually a rather heat-tolerant oil. Um, walnut oil is best uncooked. And then the omega-3 oils from fish. And the omega-3 oils from fish are, are very good for your cardiovascular health, unless that fish is fried. And then, of course, if that fish is fried, then really all the protective benefits kind of go out the window. You sort of neutralize those effects, because through the, through the frying process, you actually modify those oils and they go from being you know, unsaturated, many, as, many of us have heard of polyunsaturated fatty acids, but when you, when you cook things in oil, and it's pre especially when oxygen is present, those, um, those unsaturated oils become, they become oxidized themselves, and then they're no longer protected. So we don't want to fry our fish, we want to eat fish cooked in other ways. And then really we want to try to avoid uh, quote, bad oils. And so these would include uh, hydrogenated oils or trans fats, and we know for sure that they're bad. They cause a lot of inflammation if we look at large population-based studies. We see that consumption of partially hydrogenated oils or trans fats are um, very inflammatory and they do greatly increase risk for developing heart disease and arterial disease. And so um, this one, these, these oils are very hard to find and you really have to read labels carefully in order to find them. And um, you will, if you, if you start to read labels, you'll notice in, on many foods it will say partially hydrogenated. Um, usually it's cottonseed oil or often soybean oil. Um, there's something else I wanted to say about partially hydrogenated oils. Oh, common sources. Common sources of hydrogenated oils and trans fats um, are uh, processed or pre-prepared baked foods. And so uh, many of you, I'm sure, have seen the plastic wrapped muffins that come in blueberry and chocolate and whatever other flavors. And they'll last forever, right? Like they kind of glisten under that plastic wrapper. And you can feel pretty safe that if you had them in your basement that they would survive Armageddon, right? Like they're not going to break down. And one of the reasons they don't break down is because they're filled with trans fats and partially hydrogenated oils. And unfortunately, a lot of companies buy them to feed their employees, right? Because they're very inexpensive. So they'll bring them into meetings and they'll all be laid out there. And you'll have these nice glistening little muffins. But unfortunately, if that, or if that employer actually knew that he was increasing his client's risk of cardiovascular disease and their insurance premiums was going to go up, then maybe they'd make different food choices that they need. And actually, organizations do give good recommendations for meetings, including the CDC. So the public and public health um, uh, um, organizations are aware of this, and they do actually try to make uh, really good efforts to increase the quality of food that they're working on. Um, other bad oils would uh, include corn oil, um, shortening uh, of different forms. Shortening is really just uh, hydrogenated oil. Um, animal fats, although there's some debate about whether um, if animals are grass-fed, whether or not the quality of their fat is better. And um, the little bit of evidence that is out there suggests that those uh, grass-fed animals may have higher quality fat and that the, the oil may actually have um, more of the healthy unsaturated oils in it than the animal's fat um, compared to, say, corn fed. Um, cottonseed oil, soy oil, uh, soybean oil, and peanut oil. And um, cotton and soy and peanuts are generally considered waste crops um, in terms of agricultural land and the quality of agricultural land that's really needed to raise these crops. And so unfortunately this land um, gets uh, heavily coated with pesticides and herbicides and, and other chemicals in order, to, um, in order for it to grow anything at all. And then when you press the oils out of those foods, then they're considered to be uh, fairly high in some of those toxins. And so not, are, not only are they really not the best oils for your, your heart health because of the oil themselves, they're also not the best choices because they carry with them a lot of uh, extraneous toxins uh, through the preparation. So here, we, if we go back to the food uh, user manual, then we ask the question, well, what's so bad about fat? And really the answer is nothing. There isn't anything bad about fat. Our body needs fat. We use fat, we burn fat for energy. It's vital for our brain, it's vital for our cell structures. We need fat. It's just a matter of which choices we make when it comes to um, fats in our diet. 
And so we've developed a, you know, a very straightforward, real simple to understand icon system here just to help you uh, try to make better choices when it comes to that. And um, so if we're really going to go to, for our favorite fats, it would be the omega-3 fats that come from cold water fish, that come from things like uh, flax seeds and chia seeds and walnuts. Um, the kind of second down the list would be other forms of polyunsaturated fat as well as monounsaturated fat. And these uh, fats come from things like nuts and seeds and avocado, olive oil, and other vegetable oils. Okay. And then we start to get to some of the less friendly fats, some of the less uh, heart healthy fats. And these are really the saturated fats that come from things like cheese and milk and butter, red meat, um, some poultry, although poultry um, also, if, if you choose white meat poultry, it can actually be quite lean and not have as much saturated fat. Um, red meat poultry is actually, uh, or dark meat poultry, um, is actually a higher in cholesterol and, and higher in fat than white meat. So um, poultry can be fairly heart healthy, but uh, still not as heart healthy as our vegetable based fats. Um, coconut oil and palm oil um, are also uh, sources of saturated fat. And there's some debate about coconut oil and whether or not coconut oil is an exception to the saturated fat rule because um, it actually has very, very short chains uh, in its fat and we metabolize it, we burn it very, very quickly. Um, but I think the jury's still out about the heart healthiness of coconut oil. And um, I think in general, we should try to minimize our intake of, of refined oils uh, overall. And if, if fat is occurring in food and, and whole foods and complete foods, well then it's a natural part of that food. But um, you know, the truth is, is that we haven't really gotten to where we are now by consuming lots and lots of refined oils. That's been a fairly recent development in our, in our evolution. And it doesn't appear to be all that heart healthy. So, and then uh, once we get to the all the way to the bottom, so this is the red uh, brownie base, then hydrogenated oils and trans fats, again, showing up in things like uh, packaged uh, baked goods, and uh, of course, French fries are going to have uh, some trans fats in them too. So, just a little bit more about the omega 3 oils in fish. Um, we know that fish oil it, uh, reduces cardiovascular events, things like heart attacks. Uh, we know that uh, for people that are at risk, for having a heart attack, that is they have risk factors for a heart attack, then taking fish oils does uh, actually reduce mortality, so we know that it actually reduces um, the frequency and rate of death from heart disease. Um, Omega-3 oils will reduce measures of fat in the blood called triglycerides, and they'll actually raise our healthy cholesterol or our, L or our HDL cholesterol. So these are all some of the cardiovascular benefits. Um, some other benefits that are still being studied include that uh, Frequently uh, consuming omega-3 oils may reduce clotting risk, uh, may improve heart rhythm or, or uh, reduce arrhythmias, and may reduce our blood pressure as well. So these omega-3 oils, they are so important, they're called essential, right? And, and nutritionists speak of them as essential. And we have, to, we have to take them in through our diet. We do not make them. Our body um, cannot manufacture them. They need to come from our diet. And um, they're essential for our cells to maintain their fluidity and to function more. And here we see some dose recommendations, and um, I still think the best source of omega-3 oils is through the diet, and we're lucky to live here in the Northwest, and we have fantastic exposure and access to um, fresh Alaskan fish and Oregon fish and Washington fish, and the water here is cold, and they're filled with these omega-3 oils, and this is one of the just last places in the world where we have access to wild fish like that. So um, we should really take advantage of it and, and eat it, have it in our diet. Um, but if you're not getting at least two servings of cold water fish per week, then uh, the recommended dose is about a gram per day to reduce the risk of, of um, developing heart disease or, or um, reducing mortality if you have risk factors for heart disease. Um, the, you know, I think avocados exemplify some of the confusion around fat because avocados do contain quite a bit of saturated fat. And um, so avocados get a bit of a bad rap, and some nutritionists and other sources recommend against consuming avocados because of their saturated fat content. Um, but if you actually look at the research that's been done on avocados, if they took a group of people and they, they split them up and they randomized them, um, this happens to only uh, be 15 women, and they put them on the American Heart Association diet, this is the step three diet, so this is a very, very carefully designed diet filled with fruits and vegetables, high fiber foods, it's designed to reduce cholesterol, and um, and so they, they assigned half of the group to the American Heart Association Step 3 diet, and they assigned the other half of the group to the American Heart Association diet plus avocados. And it was actually only the avocado group that had reductions in their LDL cholesterol. 
and it was only in this group that maintained high levels of their healthy cholesterol. So there's something unique about avocados that although the fat is saturated, they have other helpful nutrients in them that um, help, uh, help our bodies get the most out of the nutrients that's in them and probably even protects us a little bit against um, some of the potential dangers of the saturated fat that's in them. And I'll give you some examples of those chemicals. <clears throat> so on to rule of thumb number three, um, when it comes to carbohydrates, best to choose whole grains and to try to eliminate or reduce white foods. And um, there was just an article recently that suggested that, that uh, moderate intake of, quote, white foods may not be that harmful. And um, my only challenge to that article would be, well, maybe they need to study it a little bit longer and see that if you only follow people for a short period of time, you're probably not going to see much of an effect. Um, but as we follow people out for many, many years, and let's face it, age and, and getting older really is the single greatest risk for developing heart disease. You know, these exposures take a long time. One meal, that's not going to knock it over, but 55, 65 years of eating in a particular way, then you start to get into trouble. So they haven't done any studies uh, looking at white foods for that long, and instead they've only been in real short periods of time. So um, what we know about these white foods is they're white because they've been refined. You know, there aren't really any white grains out there. Rice doesn't even grow white. It grows with a hull, it's usually brown. So all that has been removed. And um, as that, that, uh, the hull is removed, um, a lot of the fiber goes with it, and a lot of the nutrients that are in that grain goes with it too. And, the, um, and that has a considerable effect on our blood sugar. And so, you know, here we see, this is just an example, but this is, um, this is just an example plot that's showing the difference between, say, a white grain and a grain that still has that hull on it, that's still a hull. And we see that um, if we were to look at the white grain or the refined grain, it has, you know, look at the size of these peaks and troughs in, in someone's blood sugar that changes. And this is, um, you know, what we call high glycemic variability, and this relates to the glycemic index of that food. How quickly does the, does the starch that's in that food enter the bloodstream and increase our blood sugar? And so, um, so here we see a really high glycemic index food or a white, more refined food, whereas the blue line is more of a low glycemic index food or more of a whole food. It still has that fiber on it that slows its absorption. It still has other minerals that, or other uh, vitamins and minerals and compounds that uh, may actually help reduce blood sugar. And so here we see a nice shallow um, curve in our blood sugar. And um, we know that what these peaks and troughs trigger in our body depend on just how high and how low they go. And so, for example, with these really high red peaks, we know that when the blood sugar gets too high, it actually causes that oxidation process. Remember that first slide that we saw that, where Dr. Sariello fed him that slug of glucose and we saw those inflammatory markers change? Well, so that's, that's what is gonna happen here. And we also know that when these troughs happen, our body detects that as our blood sugar going too low. And it goes into this stress state or this alarm state and it releases some what we call counter-regulatory hormones, which means that they're trying to bring the blood sugar back up. And so not only do we have the high peak from the food that we just ate, but then we get this hormonal effect, and you can see that it can actually bring our blood sugar back up even higher. And so this is how we think that stress probably modifies the effect of our diet in terms of heart disease risk. That if you're nice and relaxed and you sit down and you eat a meal, then you, know, you may still get pretty high um, peaks and pretty low troughs, but if you're under stress, then it's gonna really amplify that. And your peaks are gonna get higher and your troughs are gonna get lower and you're really gonna start rebounding. So that's how we believe stress modifies that effect. So just to go back to our food manual, you know, carbo what? And um, of course carbohydrates. And then asking the question, what is a refined grain? And then going back to our icon system and really you know, seeing our green smiley face looking at these whole grains, things like wheat berries and brown rice, barley, quinoa, and whole oats. And we know that these foods, um, again, they retain that fiber, they retain the, um, the natural oils that are in the grains. They often uh, are higher in B vitamins and magnesium and other uh, vitamins and minerals. And they don't have that sort of ricocheting effect on our blood sugar. Um, next in line, so our yellow smiley face would be whole grain flours. And so these are flours, obviously flour has been pulverized, but um, the grains that went into that flour mill were still whole. They still had the fiber, they still had that kernel. So they've been, mod they've been slightly processed, but they do still have more fiber, and thus are going to be slower to increase your blood sugar. And then when we kind of look down at our, our least favorite, when, then we're looking at things like white rice and white flowers. And you know, I can't argue that a good French baguette made out of good chewy white flour can 
covered in butter is pretty darn delicious in the right moment. And I will not argue with that. However, day to day, whole grains are best. And so here we are, you know, asking this question, is this a whole grain? And, um, you know, not so much the muffin, probably not so much the quote whole grain bread, but, you know, this bread, looks, you know, it looks whole, it looks healthy. You still see some fiber in there, still see some grain in there. So, on to rule of thumb number four, and that is that uh, whole foods comes, come in husk, hulls, peels, pods, shells, scales, skins, and leaves, not wrappers, cans, bags, boxes, or tubes, right? Um, food doesn't grow in wrappers, cans, bags, boxes, or tubes. Um, you know, a lot of people think that you can still go into a grocery store and find healthy food, and it's very, very difficult to do that. Um, I think Michael, Michael Pollan, the author, is known for saying to uh, re recommend staying in the perimeter of the grocery store, that really the healthy foods are all the way, they're around the outside. That's where the produce section is, that's where the dairy section is, that's where the meat section is. It's really around the periphery. So the stuff in the middle is all in rock, wrappers, cans, bags, boxes, and tubes. And one of the things that you are exposed to when you choose processed foods um, is a lot of extra sodium, right? A lot of extra salt. And uh, also a lot less fiber. Usually that food has been uh, heated in some way, um, and it's often been preserved in some way, too, with an artificial preserve. Um, but uh, sodium and potassium balance is, a, is an interesting uh, concept, and um, few people know that actually if you look at the recommended daily allowance of potassium, it's about a third higher than it is for sodium. For sodium. We're actually supposed to consume a lot more potassium than sodium. Um, however, you can see that here, you know, we can see typically consumed where we see the sodium intake here at about uh, over three grams per day, whereas the uh, potassium intake is really only about 1.7 grams. Whereas what is recommended is, is the opposite of that, much more potassium than sodium. And if we look over on this plot here, when we look at uh, sources in the diet of sodium versus potassium, that we see high sodium foods are things like beef jerky, ramen soup, Italian dressing, Parmesan cheese, glazed chicken, pancake mixes. You know, here we, um, so these are all more processed foods. And yet if we look at foods that are higher in potassium, things like parsley, white beans, pistachio nuts, yams, flax seeds, kale, you know, this is where we get the, the natural potassium that, that we need in our diet. And again, we really need about a third more of it than sodium. So this is something that's really quite inverted in our culture. Next rule of thumb would be to, uh, and this one obviously focuses on, on sweeteners, um, would be to replace things like high fructose corn syrup and salt and caloric sweeteners such as sugar and honey, as well as the uh, you know, cane syrup and maple syrup and agave syrup. Um, with things like herbs and spices that help promote the natural sweetness and flavor in food. Like if you think about the, the, the foods that are really kind of cherished around the world, you know, they're not like sickeningly sweet, salty foods, right? They're complex foods. They're like Mediterranean style foods with simple, flavorful spices that sort of accent the natural flavor of the food. The things like, you know, Thai cooking and Indian fare, traditions that have been around for you know, centuries and centuries, like these cultures have figured out a way to combine um, herbs and spices and things to not only make the food taste better, but actually also to make it a lot healthier from a, a cardiovascular perspective. And we're learning more and more about the heart healthy benefits of different herbs and spices. And some of that research happens here at Basque. Back to the sweeteners issue. Um, <laughs> clearly, this uh, plot is showing you the a typical amount of sugar in uh, various common beverages, and I think that um, beverage choices is one of those. It's one of those areas in the diet that is um, that's sort of under recognized. It's sort of masked because you're like, oh, I'm just having a drink, right? I'm just picking up a coffee, or I'm drinking a, a, a specialty water that's filled with vitamins and other stuff that's supposed to be healthy or healthy for me. But if you really start to compare the sugar content of some of these things, even natural sodas, as much as 45 grams. So this is a quarter cup of sugar in a, quote, natural soda. And so, yeah, okay, maybe it's flavored by something that's natural, and maybe the sugar is organic cane syrup, but it's still 45 grams of sugar, a quarter cup of sugar that you're drinking down in really no time at all. Um, if you look at a typical coffee drink, typical coffee drink, um, this is actually a 24 ounce, so that's a large coffee drink, but it's vanilla uh, coffee without any whipped cream, so without the added fat, 83 grams of sugar. So remember that Cerello study? That was only 75 grams of sugar. So you know, here one coffee drink, and you add a little bit of caffeine, 
it actually looks like caffeine increases the rate that sugar is absorbed from different beverages. So now you've even amplified it beyond the sugar content alone. And, um, you know, coffee companies do great, right? They sell a lot of these things. So we're all exposed to this stuff. It's all around us. And it is a lot harder to choose the orange, but the orange is only 12 grams of sugar, and it still has all those other um, natural fibers and other vitamins that are healthy. Kind of a middle of the road choice would be to do to uh, choose fresh juices. Um, obviously, the juices, uh, the fiber is no longer there, um, but 100% uh, juices do still contain a lot of the same vitamins and minerals. Um, but uh, you're going to end up drinking a lot more, right? If you drink 10 ounces of orange juice, you're going to end up getting you know two to three times the amount of juice that's in a single orange. So suddenly, your sugar intake has gone from 12 grams up to 30 grams, and that's just 10 ounces of juice. Our rule of thumb number six is to eat a younger, that is a low AGE containing diet. And um, this is a, an emerging concept in nutrition research and in inflammation research. And um, it involves these uh, AGE products or age products. And that stands for advanced glycation end products. And here we see a big boiling pot of advanced glycation end products. This is a big pot of caramel that's being made. And, um, and so this, many of us know this browning reaction from, from cooking onions, right? You saute onions and they start to get brown and kind of syrupy and it really sweetens the onion. Well, that sweetening is really this same glycation process. And, um, you know, versus something like celery, which is fresh and not cooked and not oxidized at all. Now, you know, caramel versus celery, that's, you know, that's a tough comparison, I'll give you that. But um, we are learning a lot more about how these uh, age products affect inflammation and, and a, a lot about how different choices in how we prepare our foods can make a big difference with how many of these age products um, the food ends up containing when we eat it. And so uh, when we look at some dietary choices that are really high or higher in these age products, it's things like, once again, meat, full fat dairy, uh, butter and mayonnaise. And then when we look at cooking method, fried foods, broiled foods, and roasted foods. When we Look at foods that are lower, it's gonna be things like vegetables, uh, fish, unless again, it's fried and bread, um, legumes or beans, whole grains, nuts, and then when we look at cooking method, um, boiling, steaming, or poaching foods actually helps prevent the formation of these age products. And that's because in these methods, boiling, steaming, and poaching, the food itself is often immersed in water and it's usually covered, and so it actually exposes it less to oxygen, and we're not cooking it in an oil that is also going to be modified through heating. And so we can actually, um, we actually form a lot less of these. And there are a lot of restaurants here in Seattle that are starting to, not necessarily because of uh, this, but because um, poaching foods in particular has uh, become, it's kind of come back into fashion. And so there are a lot of local restaurants here in Seattle that are starting to do more poaching. You can actually find it in restaurants now, but um, historically it's been Um, just a reminder with this figure, this is another figure from our uh, food manual, is that ultimately this browning process, it doesn't, it doesn't just stay in your plate, it doesn't just stay in your stomach, it, it ends up in your blood, right? It goes, goes right in. And we can measure it, and uh, this study is an example of some researchers that measured it. And I, I should tell you what the meal is that was fed uh, in this study. And so in this study, all they did is that they actually took the same meal and they changed the way they cooked it. And that meal was uh, chicken and potatoes and carrots. And in the high age product group, they, they roasted it. So they you know, just good old roasted chicken and potatoes and carrots. Not really that exciting, but um, in the low age group, that's, uh, that they poached it instead of, uh, instead of roasting it, okay? So when they roasted the food and fed it to the individuals and they measured the age products, here we see those age products increase. <laughs> They also measured, once again, changes in oxidative stress, and this is just another measurement of oxidative stress. And here again, we see the higher uh, age product diet increase oxidative stress greater than the low. And then here we go again with that flow mediated dilation. Remember that ability of the arteries to open and deliver oxygen and nutrients. And once again, with the high age product meal, we see that very important dilation reduced. And so those age products do end up in the blood. They do increase the amount of inflammation or oxidation that occurs in the artery, in the arterial wall. And that does have a consequence with how well our uh, arteries function and their ability to dilate and deliver the 
oxygen. Moving on to rule of thumb number seven. We're learning more and more about the benefits of these polyphenol compounds in our diet. And um, it's kind of a big word, and what the heck is a polyphenol anyway? And all it means is that chemically it has all these rings in it, and you link them together, and you call it, so poly is many, and phenol is a ring structure in chemistry. And um, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that, that there seems to be a, a, a class effect, a, a beneficial class effect of these compounds. And that is that, although we were still learning about which ones may be better and more potent and stronger, but so far, the research supports that the foods that are high in these polyphenols are very helpful to our arterial wall. They improve the function of our arterial wall. They help our arteries dilate more normally. And they seem to reduce the amount of oxidative stress that happens in our body. And so some common examples are green tea. And um, green tea contains polyphenols called catechins. And um, green tea is one of the uh, food ingredients that's been recognized in the Okinawan diet and is commonly consumed in Asia and um, may be responsible for some of the um, uh, re reductions in heart disease that are uh, observed in those countries, as well as thought to be uh, at least contributory to why some individuals in Okinawa seem to live particularly long. They're actually known for their longevity. It's probably not just the green tea, it's probably a combination of some genetic factors, the green tea, um, as well as uh, they have a, a heavily marine-based diet, so they get a lot of those um, polyunsaturated fats from fish. <laughs> and they also um, consume a lot of fermented foods, and we're learning more about the effects of the normal gut flora for reducing risk of obesity, and, as well as um, potentially diabetes. So green tea, high in catechins, high in these polyphenols. Dark chocolate? is actually um, considered a health food now. Like it, is, it has become a health food, and I think it's very deserving of that reputation. Um, it, does, it is better with the higher uh, cacao content or the higher polyphenolic content, and the recommendation now suggests greater than 70%. Um, but this is another reason why we're so lucky to live in the Northwest, right? We have amazing dark chocolate right here, including some that's just a few blocks from here. And, um, you know, yeah, it's spendy, but the research suggests that you can eat as much as 100 grams a day, and it'll actually lower your blood pressure and reduce your oxygen. So 100 grams a day, that's like a quarter pound of chocolate. That's like, it's more than a, a whole chocolate bar. Um, other research has looked at, at uh, cocoa, at drinking cocoa, and uh, even drinking hot chocolate reduces blood pressure and seems to reduce measures of oxidative stress. So you, I think that you can safely consider dark chocolate a health food, and I wouldn't even be bothered if my patients ate it for breakfast. Um, blueberries are another common source, again, a, a, a fantastic Northwest food that we have great access to. Um, uh, cinnamon is, a, is another example. Cinnamon has been studied um, quite a lot in diabetes with mixed results, but some of the studies have shown um, very dramatic reductions in blood pressure, or excuse me, blood sugar, um, as well as in uh, more harmful LDL cholesterol. And then just recently, there's been a lot of interest in a polyphenolic compound in strawberries that's called fasci. And um, they've actually done studies in animal models of diabetes, of type 1 diabetes. So type 1 diabetes, the pancreas is damaged by the immune system and the body doesn't produce as much insulin as it should, and therefore blood sugar starts to uh, go up. And um, they've studied strawberries in, a, in an animal model of diabetes. And what they found is, and animal models are these models that are they're sort of designed to get diabetes, right? Like they're used as research tools and we, sort of, we know that they're going to get diabetes because they've been either genetically modified or they've been bred to get diabetes. And so the animals that were fed strawberries, they did go on to develop diabetes. The blood sugar got too high. But they actually didn't develop any of the complications of diabetes. And the researchers found out that that's because this polyphenolic in strawberries stimulates our body's own enzymes that help break down those glycation products that get formed when the blood sugar gets too high. So just like they get formed when you cook foods in, in oil and heat and you brown them, when your blood sugar goes too high in your body, that sugar can also stick to um, uh, proteins in the body. And we can actually form those glycation products within our own arteries. But strawberries actually stimulate the enzymes to come in and chew those up and to break them down so that they don't continue to modify the wall of the artery, the impact of the wall of the artery. So that hasn't been shown in humans yet, so I don't want everybody to get too excited and start consuming pounds and pounds of strawberries. 
But I think it's really only a matter of time. And really, they just need to extend those findings to humans. Um, I have seen supplements start to show up, which I'm a little astonished by, a little fascinated by. Um, but the supplements haven't been studied in humans yet, but of course, as soon as that research started to show up, people started putting it in a bottle. So once again, I would focus on eating strawberries and not taking the supplement. Um, but uh, time will tell about these polyphenolics. And again, I think that the evidence is mounting that um, you know, even just getting a, 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 a few of these into your diet on a given day, because you know, granted, these tend to, in some areas, these are specialty foods, and um, they do tend to be you know, fairly expensive foods in some cases. And um, so, you know, I don't think that you need to uh, make your diet, you know, entirely up to foods that are high in, in polyphenols. But I think sampling them from time to time and not feeling any guilt snacking on a dark chocolate bar or having some blueberries on your oatmeal and eating a few extra strawberries when you can, I think that's a good idea. So um, this is another page from the Food User Manual, and it's just reminding us to be flexible, but we really need that flexibility to be in our arteries. And it highlights, again, some of the polyphenols that um, uh, seem to have this protective benefit. And uh, we didn't talk about raspberries, but raspberries as well as pomegranate are quite high in polyphenol called ellagic acid. Um, the Indian spice or South Asian, Asian spice uh, turmeric um, is particularly high in these in coumarins, and coumarins are polyphenols that also seem to be beneficial. And then one that um, many people have now heard of is resveratrol, and resveratrol is very high in red wine, that's what gives red wine, it's red pigment. And um, there's been some fascinating uh, and very controversial research about resveratrol and its uh, purported benefits, which some of which have been questioned. Um, so stay flexible in your arteries, and one good way to do that is to uh, make sure you find some sources of polyphenols in your diet. There has been quite a lot of research on pomegranate, specifically pomegranate juice, and a lot of it was supported by Palm Wonderful, and so some people think that um, that really limits the credibility of the research that's been done. Um, I actually think some of it's been of pretty high quality, and I think that uh, if research helps get healthy food into more people, then it's really for the best. Um, but some of the studies have shown uh, things such as increased myocardial perfusion. So what does that mean? Well, that means more blood goes to the heart muscle wall. So the myocardium is the heart, is the heart muscle, and perfusion, of course, means the delivery of oxygen. So in this study, they uh, gave people six ounces per day. It was only a three-month study. And uh, they actually used a, a very sophisticated test called a spec test, and it did measure an increased blood flow. Some other research that, been, that has been done, uh, where they fed individuals just, uh, just two ounces per day, so it's like a shot glass. But they did it for three years, so it was quite a long study. And they saw a 90% reduction in that oxidized LDL cholesterol, so that, that modified, that damaged LDL cholesterol that stimulates your immune system to engulf it and store it. 90% reduction after just two ounces. Well, you know, again, three years, so more of part of a, a, a lifestyle pattern as well as a 21% in systolic blood pressure. So that's the top number, systolic blood pressure is the top number. So 21% in blood pressure, just from a shot of pomegranate juice a day. Additional research has shown increases in some of our natural uh, antioxidants, um, a reduction in, in modified or oxidized fat, and uh, once again, a reduction in oxidized LDL uh, uptake by our, by our immune system. And that was just 50 milliliters, so that's just under two ounces. That's, uh, I think 60 milliliters is two ounces. And that was three months in individuals with type 2 diabetes, and they were still able to um, measure these benefits. Rule of thumb number eight is to eat lean, unprocessed protein with every meal. And protein has um, an effect on balancing our blood sugar in that it also helps slow the rate of absorption of the starch or the sugars um, from starchy foods. And um, some options for lean protein includes things like beans, um, organic lean meats, especially poultry and fish. We've talked a lot about whole grains. Uh, nuts are another excellent uh, example. And then whey protein um, from dairy products, including low-fat organic dairy. And I think organic is important with dairy products. Um, I think it does, it certainly reduces your um, extra hormone intake, and um, I think it's just a more ethical way to uh, uh, grow food, frankly. So um, we haven't talked much about, about dairy. So let's see, I think I have a slide. Dairy. 
So back to our food user manual, and let's go through our, our icon system. So um, once again, our kind of the highest or the best on the list are going to be our plant proteins. And so sources like lentils and hemp seeds, uh, soybeans and barley. Um, soybeans are, are a common allergy, and um, soybeans have also been, uh, most soybeans that are raised conventionally are genetically modified, and so some people are concerned about that. Um, and then barley is a gluten-containing grain, and so if you're intolerant to gluten, as many people are, um, it may not be the best choice for you. But these are just examples, again, lentils, things like hemp, um, other legumes and uh, beans. And then there are functional proteins, they're sort of next in line, and so this would be, again, fish proteins, things like sardines, plain yogurt. Um, the, you know, obviously, uh, yogurt has been fermented, and so then you get the, uh, the beneficial probiotics as well as uh, an excellent source of lean protein. Perhaps uh, you know not not the optimal choice, not really a, not a bad choice, but but less than optimal would be again uh, animal sources of protein, so eggs and lean poultry, low-fat dairy. I think it's less than optimal. You know, I think moderate intake of eggs is fine. Um, I think again choosing white meat poultry is fine. Um, cottage cheese can be a, a you know really a good option for many people for breakfast. So it, this is really uh, comes back to to moderation, to moderate intake. You know, eating three fried eggs for breakfast, probably not the most heart healthy choice. We all kind of know that, right? Um, however, you know, having one hard boiled egg or a couple poached eggs on a bed of spinach with, you know, some fresh herbs and spices for breakfast, you know, once a week, probably not that big of a deal. Um, and then our sort of our least favorite options would be the high fat and processed protein. So these are going to be things like uh, cured meats and smoked meats and then full fat dairy products. And then of course red meat is gonna be on that list. And there was just another uh, large study that was released this week showing the cardiovascular hazards of frequent red meat intake. And so the, the, really the recommendation, my recommendation for patients, if you have risk factors for heart disease or if you know you have heart disease, then um, I really uh, recommend red meat no more than twice a month. So that's one, one serving every two weeks. I thought I had a slide on whey protein and blood sugar. So this is just looking at one of those glucose tests that uh, we talked about at the very beginning of the presentation. And this is when they actually uh, mixed uh, or, or fed whey protein um, along with that, that sugar. And you can see that um, adding the whey protein really modified that glycemic index of, uh, of the sugar. Go nuts. Um, so nuts, we talked about as an excellent source or as, as a good source of uh, healthy fats, monounsaturated fats, and some polyunsaturated fats. They're also an excellent source of plant-based protein. They do contain a lot of protein. And um, we're learning more and more about the cardiovascular benefits of nut intake. And these are just some examples. Once again, I think that there's a class effect that most nuts have proven to be beneficial for heart health, including peanuts, surprisingly, when they're eating this whole peanuts. I was a little surprised by that. Um, but even peanuts seem to be helpful. But here are some specific studies. This one was done on pistachios, two to three ounces per day, and it increased healthy cholesterol and um, reduced the ratio of total cholesterol to, uh, to healthy cholesterol, and as well as reduced the ratio of, of really bad cholesterol or LDL cholesterol to HDL cholesterol. Uh, walnuts eaten with high fat foods um, improved the vascular response to fatty foods. So we've talked about this phenomenon of endothelial dysfunction. Having a handful of, of walnuts before having a fatty food um, actually reduced this effect. And then pecans. Um, not a whole lot of research out there on pecans, but uh, the studies that are out there support, again, pecans help lower your, your harm for LDL cholesterol. This is looking at an example. This is a, a, another one of these studies where they uh, feed people food and look at what happens after uh, the meal. And uh, here the orange curve is, is bread alone, and then this, uh, the red curve or the red dots, this is uh, bread plus almonds. So once again, we're seeing the effect of that protein really dampening the effect of the, the sugar entering the bloodstream. Rule of thumb number nine is once again, these whole foods or more complete foods are delicious and they provide various accessory nutrients that are not in any supplement or and uh, I told you I would talk to you, I would get back to you about avocado. And we talked about the saturated fat in avocado and how there's sort of the jury's still out about that. And, but then if we look at the research, we actually see that there's a, a, a 
benefit of having avocado, that actually the avocado will help lower your LDL cholesterol. And in order to really understand that, we have to look in more detail in the avocado. We have to look at the whole food, not just the avocado as a source of saturated fat, but what else is in the avocado that may be responsible for this benefit. And here are some examples. Um, beta sterol is a plant sterol, and plant sterols are known to actually reduce your absorption of the cholesterol from different foods. So here is a, a food that contains fat, but it also contains a compound that helps reduce your absorption of some of that fat. Okay? Contains an amino acid called L-carnitine. L-carnitine helps your body metabolize fat, interestingly enough. So once again, we see a food high in saturated fat, but gives you the amino acid that you need to metabolize the fat. Is that coincidence? I'm not, I don't really think that's coincidence. You know, I think that's design. Other examples are um, those healthy carotene compounds like we fed in, in our study here at Bastier. Um, and it happens to be high in carotenes called lutein and zeaxanthin. These carotene compounds are, um, they have some antioxidant properties. And research suggests that before that LDL, before that, that uh, bad cholesterol gets oxidized or changed, that the lutein inside of it actually drops off. It gets depleted before it's changed. Suggesting, what, you know, it's not unlike the uh, results of our study, that there's something special about lutein and its role within the LDL that helps protect it. And here, you know, once again, avocado, an excellent source. Potassium, we talked about the inverted pyramid in terms of our intake of sodium being much higher than our intake of potassium, and here's a, an excellent source. And then reduced glutathione. Glutathione is an important antioxidant in our, uh, in our body. And so here we have a, a potentially oxidizing food, right, a high-fat food, that if we were to think about Seriello's research at the beginning, what a food that could potentially cause that inflammation, but yet it has an antioxidant that helps prevent that inflammatory reaction in the current. So it's pretty amazing, I think. So another example from our uh, food user manual, and here we see avocado highlighted. But look at all these others, and of course I don't have enough time to go into the details of all these other things. But but many of these compounds aren't even, I mean, we're still learning about the effects of these compounds. But so far, the effects seem to be things like helping reduce the risk of cancer, you know, helping reduce the risk of type 2 diabetes, helping reduce the risk of coronary artery disease and other forms of heart disease based on the mechanisms of these compounds. So that's pretty amazing. And, um, you know, we can get lost in all the big words or else we can just remember that if we diversify our intake of fruits and vegetables in our diet, we focus on, on getting you know, five to seven different colors in our diet, chances are we're going to get a pretty well-rounded group of these other helpful compounds as well. We've talked about many of these examples. Um, let's see if there's any other ones that I want to talk about. Talk a little bit about garlic. Garlic is, an interesting, is a very interesting food in that it has, um, it has different properties depending on how it's prepared. And fresh garlic is, um, is, is, can actually be rather irritating. And um, we use fresh garlic clinically for, for acute infections because fresh garlic is very um, bacteria, bacterial cidal. It actually kills bacteria because it's so potent. But as it ages, it, it mellows out. It doesn't be, it's not as potent, and it actually becomes uh, more of an antioxidant instead of a pro-oxidant. And that's why many of the garlic supplements that we see are aged garlic. And that's because we're going for more of that antioxidant effect. Um, but populations that consume a lot of garlic, it, you know, especially in Asia, um, it's one of the, the dietary factors that, that we think, once again, is, is responsible for their reduced rates of heart disease. So frequent garlic consumption seems like a good idea. Uh, we talked about chocolate, we talked about avocados a lot, blueberries a bit, um, cinnamon some, fish a lot, let's see. Um, I'll highlight chanterelle mushrooms just because I think it's fascinating and it's another fantastic Northwest food that literally grows in our backyard. And um, wild mushrooms are, are fascinating in that they're naturally high in vitamin D. And um, you know, you've probably heard, some of you guys have probably heard about vitamin D and the importance of having your vitamin D checked. And you know, here in Seattle, we don't get as much sun as some luckier parts of the world, right? So our vitamin D levels tend to be quite low. And uh, we did a study recently that, that suggested that um, when we sample people in the general public, about 60% of, of people here in Seattle were, had vitamin D levels that were insufficient. And um, we're learning a lot about the implications of that, including the implications for heart disease, specifically blood pressure. And it looks like having your vitamin D levels optimized helps uh, reduce your blood pressure. But what does that have to do with chanterelle mushrooms? They're naturally high in vitamin D. And when do they come out? 
Yeah. Come out in the fall. Yeah. So what's happening in the fall? Days are getting shorter, intensity of sunlight is dropping, we're not exposed to as intense sunlight, we're not going to make as much of our own vitamin D. And what does the Northwest give us? It gives us these natural, wonderful, nutty mushrooms that just so happen to be high in vitamin D. Hmm. Good figure. Rule of thumb number 10, and we're still learning about this one, but um, learn to like vinegar. And uh, some options include salad dressing, cooking, as a, using it as a cooking ingredient, or even taking just two tablespoons at bedtime. And uh, vinegar seems to have a blood sugar lowering effect and also a blood sugar balancing effect. And this is seen, it seems like it's any sort of vinegar, although a lot of the research has been done on apple cider vinegar specifically. Um, but it, is, it seems to be the acetic acid that is actually an effect of that compound. Um, and well, here's an example. So here's bread alone with the blue line and blue curve and these blue triangles. And then we have bled, uh, bleh, bread plus vinegar. Um, it's going to be the purple curve. And we can see again the significant lower in the blood sugar after that. So again, there's all these different lenses to view diet. We can talk a lot about all these different things. We've talked about some of them. Um, but how do we put it all back together? And I think the Mediterranean diet is really one of the best. Um, I think it's one of the most easily adopted dietary patterns that, um, that helps really give you a foundation for a heart healthy diet. And the Mediterranean diet has been well studied for cardiovascular disease. We know that it's heart healthy. And um, you know, if we look at the foundation, of course, it's all of these colorful fruits and vegetables and whole grains. We see even below that, be physically, uh, be physically active and enjoy meals. You know, really uh, return meals to being more social and, and being a time of relaxation and sharing and fellowship. And, you know, we've really lost that tradition. We, we eat on the run, we kind of just eat as we go. We don't really take time to enjoy and savor our food. And, you know, the reality is, is that we're all really lucky to have as much access to as high quality food as we have here in the Northwest. Um, higher up on the pyramid, again, here we see marine food. So again, there's healthy fish oils. Um, here we see uh, a little bit higher up, but we see you know lean meats and uh, lean animal foods, and then you know uh, red meats and sweets are all the way at the top. We really want to minimize our, our intake of those. So I think the Mediterranean diet pyramid is a pretty good structure. Um, I think the Okinawan dietary pyramid is, is actually also a good structure, although it doesn't work quite as well in, in uh, most of our culture. And we've attempted to create a framework around. Um, dietary uh, recommendations as well, just by, again, using our free user manual. And this is the manual that, um, and I have some copies if anybody uh, wants to take a look, but this is the manual that we use in our dietary counseling here at the Bastyr Center for Natural Health. And um, we go through, the, I've only shown you a, a handful of the pages, but uh, we really go through it in great detail and um, talk with you about label reading and, and really uh, trying to give you some good um, uh, skills to help make better choices. You guys all have a copy of the, our Heart Healthy Eating Tips uh, handout in front of you. Some of the tips are a little different than the ones that you just heard me uh, mention, but most of them are the same. And, um, you know, just an offer that if you're trying to make some of these choices and you need a little help, um, you know, we are here to help. We do spend a lot of time with patients going through these uh, different recommendations and, and trying to really brainstorm ideas that are going to work for you and your lifestyle and uh, your preferences. And um, we have a place in our food manual uh, to set some goals and to return to those goals over time. So we try to help you be accountable. And um, just you know, very, very briefly, for those of you that may be interested in, in some of our diabetes and cardiovascular disease services, um, this is just a schematic of the way that, that the Bastyr Center for Natural Health runs. Um, and that, that for our diabetes and heart disease services, uh, we, we schedule an appointment through our naturopathic medicine program. Um, specifically me, and um, then from uh, then based on your preferences at your, the time of your intake, we try to help you find the best services uh, for you and your and your goals. And so, within the Bastyr Center for Natural Health, we have acupuncturists and uh, licensed counselors. We have medical doctors. Um, we have dietitians if you need uh, additional dietary uh, advice, and we have other specialties like homeopathy and a, a physical medicine department, as well as an environmental medicine. And so we try to coordinate your care in-house, but um, we also try to help you find outside referrals too, depending upon your risk and um, depending upon your medical needs. And so we don't function in isolation, we function as part of the overall healthcare community uh, here in the Northwest. And um, there are many ways a naturopathic doctor can, can help. Um, practical behavior change tips, we talked a lot about that. 
We do offer primary care and, and uh, preventive services, you know, referrals for your routine tests, um, as well as your preventive screenings, things like your cholesterol levels and your blood sugar. Um, we do manage prescription medications here in Washington, um, and I do manage things like blood pressure medications and cholesterol medications for people who need them. Um, we provide adjunctive care in a wide range of health conditions, anywhere from common colds to things like diabetes. We provide expert advice on complementary and alternative medicine. We really are trained uh, physician experts in this area. We're trained, we spend hours and hours talking about clinical nutrition and the benefits of nutritional supplements and issues around supplement quality and issues around interactions that are uh, potentially uh, significant between dietary supplements and prescription medications. Um, so I would encourage you, if, if you're on medications and you're considering taking supplements, um, speak with a naturopathic doctor instead of a health food store clerk because um, you know, there really can be some, some clinically significant interactions that occur and it's, um, it's better to get advice from an expert. We do also do uh, physical activity prescription and then of course diet and nutrition counseling. Um, we're happy to work with your other doctors and we're also happy to work with uh, dietitians and other nutritionists. And um, this is our, our handout that we uh, give people their risk forecast. And uh, you know we, we do um, what, we, what we call point of care uh, labs here at the Bastyr Center for Natural Health. So these are labs that are done just with a finger stick. And um, we can measure your, your hemoglobin A1C. This is a measure of your blood sugar. Uh, obviously, we measure your blood pressure. But we can also measure your cholesterol um, just with a finger stick. And we can get, you, we get the results in just a few minutes. And um, based on your levels, we give you a risk forecast. And then we actually set you up with a care plan that um, outlines our recommendations for dietary counseling and stress counseling, follow-up labs, prescription medications, things like that. Um, we're unique in Washington in that we're the only clinic in Washington that actually does do endothelial function testing. And we have a device here at the Bastyr Center for Natural Health called an EndoPAT. Um, that uh, basically what it is is we put these two little probes on your fingers and we have you lay there nice and still and relax and we can, um, we can measure the, the pulse rate and the pulse wave in your, in your artery through that. And then we pump up a blood pressure cuff on your arm just for a few minutes. And we actually occlude the, the um, uh, we limit the blood flow for a while. And then we release that really quickly. And the normal response is once again, your arteries should, should dilate. And we can actually measure, you can see here in the, this is um, showing the outcome, but we can measure how larger your artery gets. And so we can actually measure that diameter. And then we compare the diameter after the occlusion to the diameter before the occlusion. And that ratio actually predicts how well your endothelial layer is functioning and how well it's able to dilate and deliver oxygen and nutrients. And we're learning a lot about what this measure means in terms of your uh, cardiovascular risk. And uh, here we see yet another graph, but this one's pretty easy to understand. If we look over here, we see cardiac hospitalization. So nobody wants this, right? We don't want, we don't, don't want to be high on this bar, right? We want to be low on this bar. So who's lowest on this bar, or lowest on this uh, axis? Um, well, those that are lowest have low risk factors, so low things like blood pressure, low, lower cholesterol, but they also have normal endothelial function, and they actually have the lowest risk. Who's next on the bar? Well, it sort of depends on who, where you look. But if you look five years down the road, we actually see that this red line is a little bit lower. And this red line, interestingly enough, is actually higher risk factors but normal endothelial function. So this suggests that there's something about, the, about assessing endothelial function that gives you information that is not captured by things like your blood pressure or your cholesterol or whether or not you smoke. There's something else there. And it actually, if, you're, if your endothelial function is normal, your risk is actually lower than the next group. And the next group is having low risk factors, but having that layer not work as well. So you could be working really, really hard. Your blood pressure could be nice and low. Your cholesterol could be nice and low. But if your endothelial layer wasn't working right, you'd actually still be at higher risk than if those risk factors were high. And you say, well, that's great. But what do we do about that? Well, we actually have interventions that, that have been studied in this area. And some of them are the dietary things that we talked about, things like polyunsaturated fatty acids from fish and polyphenolic the polyphenol compounds like resveratrol. Um, but there's, there are other things in terms of, uh, you know, some other dietary supplements have been studied. And so depending upon your function, you can either save a lot of money potentially on foods and supplements that you may not need as much of, or you might actually be able to select more optimal choices in terms of your dietary supplements if your endothelial function isn't so great. 
And, and really, a lot of the clinical trials that have been done looking at changes in endothelial function, most of those clinical trials have been done on natural substances. A few of them, there have been some that have been, uh, that have been done on drugs, but most of them have been done on these dietary compounds. So um, thank you for your attention and interest. I hope that you learned something and were at least marginally entertained. I know that I was. And um, this is, of course, the number for the Bastard Center for Natural Health, but you're also willing to contact me, or also uh, able to contact me directly. So um, any questions, any comments? You guys have all been pretty quiet. How often would you have that adult cat test done? Is that like once a year thing? Like when you have your cholesterol done, or is it how often? Yeah, you know, I'd say um, if you were tested and it was normal, then I probably, assuming that your other risk factors were nice and low, then I probably wouldn't test you again for say five years, three to five years. Um, it's really if we saw a problem that that was that's when we would retest you. Um, and so we'd probably get you started on a treatment plan and then retest you in about six months, and then if things have improved, then maybe annually for a while and then back home. But yeah, it's not a it's not a real frequent thing. And that's the number to call for appointment. Yeah, that's the number to call for one. That'll get you there. So, question. Yes, ma'am. Vinegar. Vinegar. At bedtime. Yep. I bet you don't take it straight. <laughs> <laughs> you can, right? Just down the hatch. <laughs> Two tablespoons. Just put it in water or juice? Yeah, I just put it in water. Water. Mm -hmm. okay. I, drink yeah. a, I drink a lot of water. You drink a lot of water. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah, I just diluted a little bit. You know, there used to be this this, uh, this kind of bad thing, and it was to make a vinegar toddy, where you'd take hot water and add a tablespoon or two of vinegar and just a little bit of honey to sweeten it. And it was really, really, um, it was a fad for a while. And, uh, and then it sort of fell out of favor. But uh, interestingly, you know, the, the, olive, or the vinegar does, it does help you acidify, so it probably does improve your digestion some. And then now we're learning about the effects of vinegar with helping lower your blood sugar. And um, so there's, there's probably some, some rationale for doing that. Like bedtime? Okay. Most of the studies have been done at bedtime. Yeah, the recent studies have been two tablespoons at bedtime for lowering blood sugar. Isn't it also a diuretic? It very well could be. I mean, it's... So if you yeah. want to be a diuretic, maybe you wouldn't want to take it at bedtime. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I, yeah, it's true. I, I guess uh, maybe just be careful how much you dilute it, right? Is the, well, is I, the I, acid I, not supposed to help with food? Um, slowing gastric emptying, it's not slow digestion. Yeah, I think that's that's the supposed mechanism. Is that it? That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. Is that uh, regular store vinegar? In most of the studies, they've used apple cider vinegar, which you can find in most grocery stores. It's what? Apple cider vinegar. Yes, apple cider. Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. And if you don't take care of your heart through exercise and diet, from experience, I'll tell you, you're going to wind up with a doctor telling you, I had a quadruple bypass three and a half months ago. Wow. <clears throat> this voice thing is one of the things they don't tell you is the and a cow valve replacing the aortic valve. And I take 19 pills a day, nine in the morning and afternoon. I, you know, I came to the clinic here thinking, well, Maybe they can get rid of some of them, but when you have asthma, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, GERD, I've never been able to find a disease that starts with F to add in there, but I don't think I want one. But yeah, I paid the price because I knew more about nutrition than anybody on the face of the earth, and I ate in restaurants three times a day most of my life because I never learned to cook. Yeah. Yeah, well, last month both fry pans went into the garbage. Good for recycle. You. Yeah. Good for you. Well, I'm glad you're okay. I'm so glad now I'm learning to cook for the first time in my life because I got a rebuilt heart and I don't want to ruin it. There you, know? you go. Well, yeah. good for you. And yeah. I'm glad. You know, I'm I'm glad that you're motivated now and you're here and you know you have another you have another shot. And yeah, you know, you yeah. keep your heart healthy, and there's things that you have learned. That yeah, because this valve will only last 10 years unless you take care of it. So, yeah, I don't, I don't want to repeat this when I'm in my 80s. Absolutely not. You know, well, so. good for you. Yeah. Well, thanks for, uh, thanks for coming here. You said you have to reduce salt, and with sea salt, it's the same thing. Doesn't matter. <laughs> I, I, my personal opinion is not based on science because I, there haven't been specific comparisons of sea salt versus iodized salt. 
my opinion is that sodium chloride is sodium chloride and that sodium is sodium. And if you're sodium sensitive, and not everyone is sodium sensitive, but if you are sodium sensitive, then sea salt is still going to raise your blood And, um, you know, I think that we're seeing a, a relative effect of, of sodium intake because our potassium intake as a population is so low. And that actually, if we had a higher potassium intake, we could probably get away with having more sodium intake as well, and then sort of rebalance. But because that ratio is so skewed, that we're seeing more of a, a sodium effect. So if you increase the potassium to three times or more, does that impact the sensitivity that you naturally have to sodium? Does it impact the sensitivity? Um, it, well, it, it does in that it helps regulate the hormones that, that control that balance. Absolutely. Does. And um, you know, even even switching to things uh, um, I can't remember the exact name of the product, but the 50/50 salt blends and potassium chloride blends. Um, there's actually that that makes a big difference in terms of blood pressure lowering. Um, sodium chloride supplements or other or, or not sodium chloride, potassium chloride supplements or other potassium supplements um, will also lower blood pressure, even with sodium intake things. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? One of the, um, I noticed that you, you said you do some referrals to um, MDs. Oh, absolutely. Or, I mean, do you choose them to, so they're friendly? Absolutely. <laughs> and it's great, and I mean, yeah, I, well, um, you know, medicine, medicine is a market, and there are a lot of options out there. And so we absolutely have identified providers that are friendlier to us, and as a result, they get our referrals. Are they, are you... Uh, I mean, insurance too. I mean, you know, I, I doubt my, I doubt my insurance. There, there's one, one hitch, and that is unfortunately because um, naturopathic doctors are not federally licensed. Mm -hmm. Medicare has not yet seen our value, okay. and uh, Medicare does not reimburse for naturopathic services. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, that's very unfortunate because obviously the population that has the highest burden of heart disease and diabetes is going to be those over age 65 and using their Medicare. Um, so that's unfortunate, but here at the Bastyr Center for Natural Health, we do offer $15 senior visits, and, um, and so we invite you to come. Um, we also have a network of community clinics um, around where we have a presence, including the most recent one is in the Edmonds Senior Center, mm -hmm. and um, those are $15 visits as well. Is it, there's one in Ballard too? Um, I believe the Ballard, uh, there is one is, in Ballard. Is it, I don't recall do you have $15 that. here in the, at the center? Yes, ma'am. Why was it two blocks away? Yeah. I'm 36. Yeah, and you know, again, I, I, I thanked our, our patients earlier for stepping up, and, and um, you know, we really do offer fantastic learning experiences for our, our students. And, um, you know, in, in team care here at the Bastyr Center for Natural Health, you are aligned with an advanced standing student clinician, so a, a naturopathic student in our final year. And so when you come in for your appointment, you see them initially, and then their attending physician or someone like myself would then come in with you and, and ask you additional questions. And it's really the naturopathic doctor who's behind the scenes sort of driving the ship and making the final decisions on your care. But you do spend more face time with a student clinician. Um, but many of our faculty also have uh, practitioner care practices as well. That's better than having time in the medical system. I'm sorry? It's better than having a, I mean, time with your medical assistant. Well, our student clinicians are, they are your clinicians. The they are extremely not, engaged in your care. Think, so. Yeah, they're, they're engaged with it. Well, they have a six week journey. The, a medical system. Uh -huh. Yeah. Nah, it depends. Mm -hmm. Do you do lab work here? Other than the A1C and the point care, do you have full lab? We have full labs here. We actually have a, a site for Pacific Physicians and Laboratory here within the Bastyr Center for Natural Health. So it's an official um, draw site for that lab. So it's a full facility clinical lab. And then we send out in addition to those if we need really special tests. Mm -hmm. Do you we get customers that are that use the clinic as their primary care providers? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. What you is said it? you said you is, is legal in Washington State? Absolutely. So the insurance companies would cover that as your primary care provider? In in many cases. It's a little bit insurer dependent in terms mm -hmm. of um, you know, primary care is unfortunately is a bit of an insurance term and some insurers do um, limit who can be chosen as a primary care provider and that impacts it, it can impact things like um, payment for your preventive services but here in Washington those services are, are I can't say every time but in most cases are covered if they're ordered by a nature doctor.
and you know we carry. I mean, we um, accept you know, Regents and Primera and Aetna and you know the whole long list. If if uh, I go to my regular MD, which is covered under Medicare, mm -hmm. and he orders lab, then it can be lab here. Absolutely, and we do that a lot. And we even that will be covered under Medicare, but here the lab work would not be covered under. Medicare. That's that's right. And it can be expensive. And it can be expensive. And so what we do in that situation is we will order your labs and we'll fill out a, a lab order for you. And um, we'll often write a letter to accompany that lab order and we'll, we'll, we will request that your primary care provider order those labs for you. And sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. And sometimes they do some and we negotiate. And, we are you know, quite a few. But just a payment, let's sorry. See the average, you know. Yeah. $16, which is about four dollars Four, five hundred, or a thousand dollars. That's exactly right. And you know, remember, everything's for sale in medicine, including lab tests. Mm -hmm. And so, it is. It's important to have somebody who helps you really make decisions about what lab tests are right for you, and not overorder lab tests because you're right. The prices do get very, very high. Mm -hmm. And even lab tests are something that someone is selling that the lab is trying to sell. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah, so you need somebody to, to help question negotiate the lab that. because I have. Lab test drawn for my diabetic study. I'm at the University of Washington, and I had one done the next day at the Paul Clinic. Right. It quite a bit of difference, too much. Right. My A1C was 6.5 versus 7.2. Right. Yeah, there, there can be variability in, in lab much. results like that. And so that's really why we, we like to follow trends in labs and we like to have some consistency. So, you know, we know, you know, Pacific Physicians is going to have their process. And so if we follow your results over time through one lab, then we're more likely to see trends for change, not an not a absolute value. We don't get fixed on any one value per se. Well, I think that we're, if there's no other questions, we're about out of time. So thank you all for your attention. Thank you. Thank you.